The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Quality in Action webinar for June, uh, talking about the Mentoring Partnership of Minnesota's K-12 Journey Map and the impact of mentoring on the academic outcomes. I uh, decided to play around with a poll here uh, to see what folks who have signed up are more interested in, perhaps the research or in the actual K-12 journey map, um, thinking about that our quality and action series really tries to bring some research and, and make connections to um, what are some of the quality practices or some of the tools that uh, folks in the field are using. So uh, it looks like those who signed on today um, have a little bit more interest in, in research. If you can see that the poll ended with 96% of you voting and 65% uh, more interested in research on mentoring and academic outcomes, and 35% more interested in, in the K-12 journey map and how to use it with matches. I think that means you might be interested in both, but just leaning a little more uh, towards the research. So that said, we've only got an hour, and there uh, there's tons of, of information to cover, and we should uh, just keep moving. So welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, as always, a little bit of webinar logistics. We had um, a huge response, or, or bigger response anyway, to this topic. So there's clearly lots of interest in it. So we do have um, lots of you registered and um, currently have um, many of you attending. We have over 50 people registered, many from Minnesota, but also from all over the country. Right now we're at about 37 with our panelists. Uh, so we will, and I know there's going to be more people who will sign on. So please do, uh, you know, everyone will be muted during the broadcast here, but if you would like to ask a question, uh, you can raise your hand and Lindsay Carlson will, uh, my trusty sidekick here, will uh, unmute you so that you can just ask the question to the group or if you have a comment to make. Um, we really do welcome that kind of interaction. Or we do know that lots of you, um, you know, maybe are listening via speakers and don't have microphones, or if you're on the phone and whatnot, um, feel free to type questions as well. There's a question section on the bottom right, and you can submit those questions to us. We'll respond directly to you, or um, Lindsay will read the question aloud to, to everyone if it's something that applies to, to everyone. Uh, when you are unmuted, just monitor your background noise. We'll try to do the same on our part. Uh, so if you have questions, any other questions about logistics, having trouble hearing someone, um, that sort of thing, you can pop that in the question area as well, and uh, Lindsay will try to handle that uh, directly with you. So what we're going to cover today is um, some just looking at some of the research on the impact of mentoring on academic outcomes. There's a lot of different directions we could take with that. There's a lot of information out there. Um, so. Uh, I've just picked uh, a few things that I thought were particularly interesting to share or that might include or, or reference some of the other body of research that, that is out there. Uh, then we'll take a look at the K-12 journey map, uh, sort of where did it come from, how to use it, some of the response and how, how others are using it, and any plans for, for where it's coming from next, next where it's headed next. Uh, also, it put together a lot of resources, and I will, um, after... The webinar, this, this PowerPoint, will be posted on our SlideShare page, uh, so you can download it and have all of those links to some different resources. So uh, if you didn't see it before uh, before the webinar, we'll, we'll put it up there afterwards. And we'll also send, we send a follow-up email uh, with links, so I'll send a direct link to that SlideShare so you can look at the PowerPoint and get, get all the information that's included here. But anything else that comes up during the webinar. Sometimes we get questions that say, can you send us that? Anything that anybody mentions, um, any of those resources or anything that, that links and attachments and things, I make a running list and, and in our follow-up email to you, um, we'll send all of those things to you. So this is who we're talking to today. This is uh, 
Uh, top left there is me, April Reardon, the Director of Training and Community Partnerships here at the Mentoring Partnership of Minnesota. Uh, later on, when we start talking about the journey map, we'll be talking to Mayan Kapanki, our Vice President of Marketing and Public Policy, and also Mindy Twetton, our AmeriCorps Marketing and Communication Specialist, uh, who's, you know, we all know that we've got great AmeriCorps members, which has been um, involved in really uh, helping with the K-12 journey map, but also assembling a toolkit uh, to help programs um, look at how, how they might use that tool. So just to kind of set the tone, uh, it just happened to have been reading some things this week uh, through different newsletters and whatnot, and, and just wanted to mention the the goal of, of, of the White House and, and this current administration is to um, really have the highest proportion of students graduating from college in the world by 2020. And that that's come up and, and thinking about one of the things that we have to do, you know, regardless of educational path after high school, all Americans should be prepared uh, to enroll in at least one year of higher education or job training and, and really thinking about that workforce development. But that we want to have the highest proportion of students graduating college in the world by, in the world by 2020. So th putting that into context, you know, that we're really looking at academic outcomes when we think about the context of the journey map, it's about high school graduation and go going on beyond that. Uh, and I also just happened to uh, come across a post on, on, the, on the Huffington Post from an AmeriCorps member who was writing about her experience uh, in City Year, and this is in Los Angeles, uh, but also looking at you know, sort of the grim statistics around how many of her sixth grade students uh, might graduate. So, you know, this is the beginning, sort of at the beginning of her, her post at the Huffing, on the Huffington Post, but if the prevailing research is accurate, nine of the 12 year, the 34 12 year olds she's working with are already on track to drop out of high school. Uh, and also she cited some uh, research from Johns Hopkins University that found that by the sixth grade, students who show any of three early warning indicators, so this low attendance, behavior problems, or course failure, have only a 20% chance of graduating. So as we look at some of the research on academics, some of these warning indicators come up where a lot of times our outcomes for mentoring programs are seeking to address low attendance or truancy. Uh, there's also some outcomes about reducing behavior problems in the classroom. And the course failure, you know, many of our programs are looking at improving um, testing scores or looking at outcomes related to grades or GPA. Uh, so knowing that those are all relevant, but also looking at the research to see what else does mentoring tell us or what else, what other kinds of impacts can mentoring have. So for that portion of the webinar, um, we're going to look at a few things. So the impact on academic outcomes for, uh, we're going to look at the information that's in a chapter of the Handbook of Youth Mentoring on Academically At-Risk Students. Uh, also some research on the aid, this, this is the title of the, the article, Agents of Change, Pathways Through Which Mentoring Relationships Influence Academic Adjustment. Also wanted to, I just brought back a, a few slides from a Research in Action webinar that we did on school-based mentoring. So, you know, what do we know from school-based mentoring? Because oftentimes our uh, academic outcomes or having an academic focus for mentoring, we, it's easy to do the research in a school-based setting because we know that that's, that's what they're looking for. Uh, but also uh, then to look again at the research from the uh, United States Department of Education Student Mentoring Program, which uh, if any of you were previously funded by that, we know that um, based on that research that funding was ended. So part of my reason for, folk, for bringing this out is that I just haven't seen a whole lot of attention given to this chapter in the Handbook on Youth Mentoring. Um, if you don't have a copy of it, I highly recommend getting that, but there's also a, a second edition in the works as well, so maybe hold out for that. But this is from Chapter 29, and it's really looking at special populations. Uh, but really, how do we look at academically at-risk students, but 
presenting some of the characteristics of, of you know, so what are academically at-risk students, what are some of those things, um, the different models of mentoring that, that we use to approach uh, reducing that academic risk and, and in increasing and improving academic outcomes, um, which then leads to some three major hypotheses for those mentoring models, like what are the things that we think uh, those mentoring programs can accomplish or, or that we're, we're thinking that the outcomes would be, and do they really accomplish that? So some of the characteristics of, according, you know, in this chapter, that, you know, this understanding of, of who this population is, uh, they highlight some of the characteristics that academically at-risk students might have low levels of perceived school competence. Uh, you know, negative representations of school in general or of teachers in particular. They might have had bad experiences uh, with schools and teachers. You know, these are some of the things that we're up against uh, in working with these students. They have an extrinsic motivation in relation to school or external attributions for both school and career-based decisions. Um, you know, that they're not necessarily having this this autonomy or, or an internal or intrinsic drive to achieve academically. Uh, they might have a lack of interest in school-based and extracurricular activities, uh, difficulty seeking help from teachers and peers when exposed to failure. So if they're up against, uh, you know, they're not doing well, they might not be willing to ask for that help. Uh, problems with time management, attention in class, preparation for examinations, and, you know, poor coping skills. Uh, based on the school expectations or different transitions from school to school. So those things probably all sound familiar if you're a program that's working with academically at-risk students, that those are all of the things that we hope mentoring will, will fill the gaps. You know, that mentoring, but, it, but we also know that mentoring needs to account for some of those student characteristics. We need to be able to prepare mentors for what they, what they might be up against. They're not necessarily uh, if they're mentoring academically at-risk at students, working with, with kids who are you know, excited about school or, you know, have a really positive attitude about school or, you know, they might not have the same kind of motivation that the mentor remembers having when they were in school. So before I move on to, uh, so some of the models of mentoring that are mentioned are, uh, you know, one of the models is from, focuses on interpersonal mechanisms, so sort of the relationship experience, the relationship closeness, also mentor characteristics. Uh, another, uh, you know, and this, another model would be more focused on um, the pathways of mentoring. You know, so the first model might be about um, the quality of the mentoring and how um, how the quality of the match. And the second piece would be more about the pathways and that if mentoring can influence young people's relationship with their parents, for example, then by having a better relationship with their parents, young people might, that might be predictive of doing better in school. But another model that the chapter really focuses on and, and provides some more information is this mentoring, uh, the socio-motivational model of mentoring and identifying feelings of competence, relatedness, and, and autonomy. So I gotta find my little highlighter here. But yeah, so this competence, relatedness, and autonomy. And according to this model, the degree to which a mentoring intervention positively impacts their academic achievement depends on how much we can improve those areas. So, you know, the competence might be positive beliefs and expectations. We just said that some of the characteristics of academically at-risk students are that they don't have those positive beliefs or expectations um, about their ability to reach academic goals or objectives. Um, this relatedness might be about the development of that attachment between the, the student and the mentor uh, that might help them. This is sort of ties into the pathways piece, that second model, but can help establish supportive relationships with school members. So if they can learn how to relate to a mentor, they might be able to learn better how to relate to teachers and to other school personnel. And the autonomy then, if we can increase autonomy, 
then that really focuses on that intrinsic motivation. So when the so when the mentor goes away, or if the mentor is not around, how do we how do we instill in these young people this desire and, and motivation about their personal and academic choices? Uh, so the changes in these three types of feelings, you know, that we the according to the model, the three aspects of the mentor behavior. So the things that we need mentors would be mentors to do, or that are critical in the development of these three, the student's cognitive and emotional processes are structure, you know, the extent to which mentors provide guidance and information uh, necessary for the students to be internally motivated. Uh, clearly stated expectations that the mentor has, uh, you know, the importance of these expectations. Um, consequences of meeting versus not meeting those expectations. So providing some of that structure. And I think uh, the journey map, when we look at that, is something that can help mentors get at uh, how to, providing some of that structure. Uh, the involvement is the mentors, really their emotional resources. So you know, if we're also thinking about different mentor approaches, the structure might be some of that more instrumental piece and, and this involvement piece might be more developmental and, and gets at a little bit more of that uh, relationship quality. Um, but this involvement, you know, this is spending enough time. You know, we keep going back to some of those things about longer relationships and, and dosage and uh, being interested in and attentive to the student. Um, helping them work through negative emotions, uh, you know, about being supportive, uh, helping them to, with, to get support or, or to mobilize resources when they need them. Uh, and this autonomy, and autonomy support, so this is from the mentor as just affirmation of that student as a unique and active um, individual. You know, acknowledgement of which also gets into this development piece too about being youth-centered and also acknowledging that their feelings, um, encouraging them to for independent thinking and problem solving, um, opportunities to make choices. And again, all of these pieces, really the journey map, you know, some of those steps of the journey map, sometimes you look at it and it seems really simple, but if these, this is the complex kind of stuff that we want mentors to be doing, then we need to be able to give them tools in order to do it. You know, showing them a, a, a model like this probably uh, would be a little overwhelming, but the idea then is if we can get mentors or mentoring interventions to provide, you know, structure, involvement, auto and autonomy support, that then we're going to develop this competence, relatedness, and autonomy in kids, uh, and that hopefully the students will then be better at seeking help, be better at time management, be better at examination preparation, and all these things that we talked about were characteristics of academically at-risk students. Uh, and ultimately then, you know, so it's a lot of this pathway and this model of if we put this mentoring in and we do these things, what are we going to get out of it? But hopefully this achievement and persistence. So we want them to, you know, get good grades and, and come to school and graduate and persevere and go on to whatever sort of higher education or workforce uh, to be, you know, a, a productive member of our workforce. Um, and again, down here, you know, not to overlook the fact that the characteristics of the, the protégés or the mentees, uh, the characteristics of the mentors and the context in which they're building that relationship are, are incredibly important. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different things that, that go into how well we're able to accomplish these things. Uh, okay, so also within this chapter, just to, to keep moving on here, I just wanted to, to show, so there's these three hypotheses about, you know, what we're going to get from, from mentoring. So we assume with mentoring, and, and so this is the, in the handbook of mentoring, this meta-analysis and looking at um, the existing research on mentoring. And so, you know, what they're looking at in this chapter then are, you know, what do we know? What do we know so far? So if, if we assume that mentoring should lead to improved cognitive and social emotional development, uh, you know, this is what, these are the things that, that research is showing us, that mentoring relationships do all of these things, improve attitudes towards school, 
this academic confidence, I mean, this long list, feelings of school connectedness, perceptions of support from significant adults outside of, of mentoring relationships. Uh, we know that, it, that, we, that we do these things. Finding my... But what we do need to highlight is that, you know, we have to assess the impact of mentoring relationships. What would be nice is to look at longitudinal designs because, uh, you know, there's a possibility that changes, you know, some of these things, um, that there might be that there might be other things that are impacting that. So you know they're not it's not perfect, uh, perfect research, but we are looking at some of the research. You know three studies. Uh, we've got the the Big Brothers Big Sisters program, um, looking at those pathways, which we'll also look at look at next. We also have um, that connectedness to parents that shows some of that. Um, looking at some of Dr. Karcher's research, which is also comes up later. Um, also looking at how mentoring relationships can buffer behavioral and emotional problems, um, something with um, David Dubois and Neville et al., but social support from significant uh, adults outside mentoring relationships. So um, a lot of different things that can happen. It can, these, you know, it's all helpful in understanding the processes by which mentoring relationships can have positive effects. So, also the the a second hypothesis with that mentoring is that mentoring provides students with the opportunity to change and learn new behavioral strategies. So th some of those things over here on the right side uh, are the, the you know the truancy types things. You know, where that mentoring is linked to higher attendance in class. I thought it was important to include this part, but not sufficient to neutralize academic risk. That you know, it might be they're truant less, but it doesn't mean they're not truant. Um, you know, fewer voluntary absences again. All of these things that we were listening at, uh, that we were looking at before, but also greater rule compliance and ability to complete schoolwork. Um, but here was one of the one of the places where I saw greater participation in college prep activities, overall greater likelihood of taking part in higher education. Um, which you don't see a lot of that. There's a lot of um, programs, I think, in their evaluations that are looking at grades and GPA and, and um, those types of outcomes. But in order to, to find out more about greater participation in college, we need those, those, that longevity. Or we need more programs that are working with older youth. You know, a lot of mentoring might happen when, when kids are much younger. And we don't know until later what kind of impact it may have had for the long term. Uh, and so the third piece is that um, that mentoring will affect personal and academic development. Um, you know, and these are the researchy words, but modulated by both internal and external factors. But basically that, you know, the characteristics of the students and of mentors in the context of the program uh, are going to affect the effects of mentoring on, on academic development. So, you know, these are things that if, if you've been a part of these webinars, or if you've been reading research, you don't, um, won't necessarily be surprised by. But, uh, but we've also seen that stronger effects from mentoring when the academically at-risk students had more favorable life circumstances and better social and psychological functioning. There are, uh, but in addition, so in contrast to that, stronger impacts of mentoring for um, those with initially low or moderate achievement levels, as opposed to those with high achievement levels, which um, the you know the, the chapter points out could also be a ceiling effect that you know if we're as high as it can go, then uh, you can look for a whole lot more of an impact. Uh, looking at you know this is the again the mentors with backgrounds in helping professions. Many of you might be familiar with that that there were some more positive effects. And again, this is looking at academic, um, personal and academic outcomes, but primarily on academic. Um, and so those were characteristics of the mentees or of the protege. So the mentors, some things that we've seen before too about, uh, and this is the, the section that I think is important if we look at the journey map and other tools is that the mentors belief that, that, that they can be effective uh, in helping this young person um, 
it, that's an important piece, or if they have interests in common, they might be more efficient in establish those, establishing relationships. Um, and then finally, this ongoing structured training for mentors, the monitoring, uh, and the duration, dosage, and mentor, mentor's approach. So providing tools like a journey map um, might, might be part of that structured training at the ongoing piece. Or, you know, if you're monitoring and supporting mentors, you, could, you can provide some tools and, and structure for them to work through, um, which will help them develop those relationships and, and, and hopefully initiate an intervention that can be really effective. It also comes at it from, a, a, from that approach of let's do this together as opposed to the mentor just bringing in an, an agenda. Uh, so this is a, another piece of research, and part of this, just to um, keep us moving along, I don't want to um, go over time, and I want to make sure we look at the, the journey map. But So the next few things, I might go through them quickly, but um, they're just some things that if you're interested in, in research on the outcomes of, uh, of mentoring on academic outcomes, uh, thinks that you want to read the entire article. But so this is just at, you know, looking at that agents of change and thinking about, again, the pathways through which mentoring relationships influence um, that mentoring does have a positive impact on grades and other academic indicators, but that it's this, this one talks a little bit more about how, you know, so thinking about if we can, you know, control a little bit of or, or have some impact as pro managers of programs, how do we improve? and what we put in or what the mentor does, but by improving the relationship between the youth and the parent. So that young people with mentors have a more positive relationship with their parents, and then ultimately that relationship with the parent is predictive of academic success or, or academic better academic achievement anyway. Uh, but also that mentoring is linked to boosting the youth's perception of his or her academic abilities, which Again, in turn, if you're looking at another one of these models and, and, and in the article, the published article, you can see uh, different diagrams of, of, of how this all works, but you can see kind of how the flow or this pathway um, through which mentoring relationships have that, have that influence. Uh, so this is one of the, you know, this is a, the Big Brothers Big Sisters impact study, so looking at the um, Big Brothers Big Sisters agencies, uh, and this is looking at school-based mentoring programs. So, um, but knowing that school-based programs might might have, you know, looking at more of an academic uh, uh, influence, but not necessarily um, having that be their primary focus. But that mentored youth did improve more than non-mentored peers in aspects of that school performance and behavior. Which, if we went way back, those were definitely some of those warning signs that were mentioned. Uh, so they're also more confident, uh, which again is something that we know is predictive of, of doing better. Uh, and the size of the benefits were same as the community-based program, but only in the school-related outcomes. So thinking of some of the other things that we, that, that mentoring can do that we know might lead to um, better outcomes academically, that didn't, those didn't necessarily show up. Uh, and also here, so this is the SMILE impact study with, um, from Dr. Karcher, Michael Karcher, but um, looking at communities and schools. And we're looking at uh, some older students and predominantly Latino. And this is, again, school-based mentoring with relationships that were somewhat brief. Am I hearing a feedback? Feedback? Somebody hearing something? Okay. Sorry, I'm hearing some some feedback or something. But okay. So self-reported connectedness to peers, self-esteem improved, but this one didn't find impacts in other areas, including grades or attendance. So, but knowing that the duration of the relationship was brief, um, you know, size of the program effects were small. So. You know, a little bit of, of, of not as much of an, an impact on the academic outcomes for this one, on the grades and the attendance. Uh, and, you know, finally, to look, another thing to look at would be this impact evaluation of the United States Department of Education Student Mentoring Program. Uh, you know, this research would tell us that 
mentoring doesn't work enough. It doesn't say it didn't work at all. Um, they were really looking at effect si sizes and st statistically significant impacts uh, on these three domains of academic achievement engagement, those interpersonal relationships and personal responsibility, um, you know, the high risk or delinquent behavior. Uh, you know, but the question is really, you know, what research is out there? What about that really improves graduation rates? I think um, probably some of that is on a program by program basis. If you could track your mentees over time and find out, uh, is there a link? Is there a connection between um, those who were mentored and those who weren't? Uh, it's hard to do that for, you know, to have an experimental design with that. You know, what about the transitions to higher education and success in college? There's there's more research out there about uh, first-year students and, and mentoring on campus and with first-year students. Did you hear that? Okay. Uh, do the relational impacts of mentoring carry more weight later on? Like I said before, what do we know about, you know, if a, if a young person was mentored and knowing that a lot of our mentoring relations are relationships that we're looking for, you know, even here for the student uh, Department of Ed student mentoring program, they found the average length of the relationship was 5.8 months. But even if we hit that one year mark or or two year mark, if somebody's mentored from the ages of eight to ten, what impact does that have on their graduation rate or transitions to higher education? Or if we've mentored them from when they were 16 to 18, would that have a different kind of impact? I mean, ultimately, there's a lot of questions there about where do we focus mentoring if our goal is academic achievement and graduation and higher education. Uh, you know, and one thing throughout all of the research that, that we read is always the caveat that a quality mentoring program and, and having all the pieces in place for, for screening mentors and, and things that we know about the elements of effective practice, about training mentors, uh, supporting and monitoring them, all lead to, are all critical to having those, those greater outcomes. Uh, any questions or comments or other, you know, there's other, other research out there, this is by no means mentioning every piece of it, but that ultimately, Yes, research shows that mentoring can have a positive effect on academic performance. Um, you know, some research has shown that impact on grades and other academic indicators. We've seen it about unexcused absences, about student attitudes towards school, um, less likely to be disruptive, uh, you know, and that the results increased, in, in, especially in the Big Brothers Big Sisters study, results increased for youth who had been mentored longer. Okay, I'm still hearing that. We're still trying to figure out if you hear a, kind of a weird feedback thing, we're trying to figure out what that is. But um, anyway, submit your, your questions or comments if you have any more, but we'll move on to the uh, showing you the journey map. And we can discuss more too. So that K-12 journey map, uh, I'm going to bring it up and actually look at it. Oh my goodness, this audio. Okay, so the K-12 journey map, we've got this background, we've got Wired for 2020. Um, I'm going to ask Mayan and Mindy, and I'll mute myself and see if that takes care of some of our feedback a little bit. Um, but this is where, um, Mayan, if you would want to jump in and, and just, I'm going to bring up the, I'll open the link and show the journey map. And if you want to tell us some background sure. and, and history of how it came to be. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? I'm not, okay, great. Um, so the K-12 journey map was created by the Mentoring Partnership as part of our Wired for 2020 campaign in 2009, and it's our 
uh, Minnesota's first interactive tool, and it's, it provides milestones and resources to help youth prepare for post-secondary education. Um, what's exciting about this is that this is not something that um, we actually had in mind to create as a tool. It came about because we had a uh, we had quite a few corporate sponsors or corporate partners who have a mentoring initiative within their corporation, and they said, you know, really, really great because we work primarily with um, youth in middle school and high school to give our mentors something tangible so that they can um, support these young people and know that they're making a difference. So we launched this tool um, during our Wired for 2020 campaign in, in April 2009, and basically that campaign was to educate and engage young people in um, STEM education and um, to show them that they're, they need to have a strong foundation in math and science no matter what career path they choose. Um, we had a big event at the Mall of America and we had hands-on STEM education exhibits that represent innovation and businesses and um, and the companies gave the youth a glimpse of what life and work would be like in the year 2020 through these innovations. So, um, so General, uh, General Electric, excuse me, came to us and said, you know, we have a strong initiative with Roosevelt High School in um, South Minneapolis and we really need to give our our mentors a tool of some sort to help them guide uh, their mentees on um, preparing for college. And so they, um, they provided the seed money to create this tool because we knew through our STEM education work that there were quite a few um, resources already out there. Nothing that we, um, we wanted to recreate. There were a lot of great um, websites devoted to STEM education. There were some uh, great tools and hands-on experiments, things like that, for all ages um, of students. And so what we did is we had already compiled a bunch of those resources. And then we worked with um, the University of Minnesota and um, their um, consortium, excuse me, I've got a phone ringing here, uh, the College Readiness Consortium. And they had already outlined uh, major milestones between the, the grades of uh, 8 to 12 and, and where youth really need to start preparing for college. So we incorporated their milestones with the resources that we had already um, learned about in this K-12 journey map. It, it happened very quickly. We, um, we were able to work with a great design group, Peggy Lortonson's design group, to map this out and create a visual roadmap for young people and to make it fun and interactive, something that's accessible online for them at any time, um, something that's interactive where there's games, tools, resources, and information for them. Um, and, and really put it in one, in, in one um, tool. The feedback that we had heard from students and from some of these mentors was, you know, these, these kids are getting some of this information here and there from their counselors, but that doesn't always make it home to the parents or to the guardian or, you know, even to the mentor. And so this was a, this was a great effort to um, combine what we already knew was out there with um, with the university's research on how youth should prepare for college um, and put it in one tool. So that's a little bit of the background on the K-12 journey map and um, I think this is an appropriate time for us to show a little bit more in depth about what's in the tool and um, Mindy has created a wonderful toolkit for um, anybody who wants to use this to give you a little history background and also how this this tool can be used with mentors and mentees. Thanks Mayan. Um, so some people have asked why they should use the journey map to begin with and um, obviously it's a great match activity because it's a structured way to address academics even if you're not part of a formally academic program um, and it's perhaps more importantly a tool to help start the conversation about preparing for college, college success for any youth you know. Um, the youth may not know that it's important to start now because really the laying the groundwork for college success starts in early childhood and um, they don't know that there are things they can be doing now and the journey map takes them through that. If the youth is aware that they should be thinking about it, the idea might be so daunting that it's simply unapproachable. And the journey map kind of puts it all in one easy to navigate place, as Mayan was saying. Um, and it's all in the context of their world. Um, what April's showing on the screen right now is a toolkit that we put together to help mentors and mentoring programs know how to use this because, okay, maybe we all get that it's important, but how do you get the youth that you're working with to understand that as well. So this chart on the screen shows 
some salary differences um, depending on your education because obviously a lot of kids dream of having big houses and fancy cars when they grow up and, and education is going to help them get the means to acquire those. Um, very basically, if you want to switch over to the journey map at South April. Give her a second here. So people look at it sometimes and have just been, okay, where, where do I start? It's very simple in that all you do is you find the grade of the youth that you're working with and you hover over the milestones and review each one. Now, certain milestones which were um, determined by the Consortium for College Readiness over at the University of Minnesota are going to make resources pop up or rather links to resources that you can click on. So we can go ahead and walk through a couple of those. Um, let's say you're working with someone who is in eighth grade and you click on that college um, college.gov icon that April just clicked on. This is a great interactive site. When you're in eighth grade, you're not going to decide what your major is. And again, it's about putting it in the context of that person's world. Um, that college.gov site, if you want to click on tools, April, over on the right hand side in that black box, there are some great um, tools for youth that are really interesting. So yesterday I was kind of playing around with it. There's one where you can click on um, basically just characteristics that you consider yourself to have. You know, I'm a good writer, I make people laugh, things like that. And I'll bring up testimonies and advice from people who also have those characteristics and how they applied those to their college and professional lives. And they can, you can create a poster as a youth with kind of your objectives and then it, it puts some tips in there for them as well. Um, back over to the journey map, another example of a resource that we have um, if you're working with someone in ninth grade, a lot of youth are concerned about saving for college. That's a huge hurdle for a lot of people. So you click on that, learn about saving for college, and it takes you to this Mapping Your Future page where there are a whole bunch of questions um, that they can explore and different options for raising that money. Uh, for the kids who are in 12th grade, and I should mention that a lot of people forget if you're in 12th grade and you've missed all these other milestones, it's not too late to go back. So it's often important to review um, previous milestones and catch up because you can always catch up. Um, but if you click on the ACT and SAT prep for your 12th grader, it's going to bring you to those web pages. They're going to show you where to take the tests, how to register, when those tests are going to be, and then it also has practice exams um, and test prep in general. So there's a lot of really good, important resources that every youth preparing for college needs. And that toolkit that April was showing before, um, we can email that to anyone who is interested in that kind of builds on this whole idea of how to use the tool. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, uh, and, you know, while we have the toolkit up and there's some great testimonials in here, but uh, Mayan, I think if you could tell us a little bit more about, um, even more about the response to the tool, um, we've had requests to use it from all over the place and um, a little bit about what's next for it or, or anything that uh, you need from people who are listening or, or things like that. Uh, absolutely muted. Um, can, you, can you launch back to the tool itself, April? I was thinking, you know, as April was going through the research and as we were talking about the socio-motivational model, I mean, I was thinking about how this, um, this journey map tool applies to the structure, the involvement, the autonomy. If you look at the structure, um, the structure part of this tool is that it creates and, and outlines the milestones for youth to prepare for college starting in eighth grade. Um, the involvement piece is that this is extremely interactive um, for both the mentors and the mentees is a, and a wonderful guide to help uh, for the mentors to help the young person figure out what it is that they need to prepare um, during each grade. And then the autonomy support um, on this is that it's, it's accessible at any time. And what the youth can do on this is they can 
they can accumulate their achievements as they go through this journey map, which is which is a wonderful thing because, like Mindy said, I mean, if you're in eleventh grade, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't go to college and that you um, that you've missed the mark. So you can go back and take a look at some of the things. Now, of course, some of the icons on here you can see you can't go back and, and um, recreate, but there are a lot of resources and tools that can still get to can get you to where you need to be and help you prepare and that's that's the importance of having that strong mentor in your life um, to help you prepare for that and and to go back and to look at some of those resources and say okay here's you know we're starting from this point and we're going to build on um, and we're going to catch up so um, I just wanted to put that in that context of the of the research that's out there in terms of how I would apply those three um, those three bullet points to this map. Um, the exciting part is that when we launched this tool, um, and now I'm getting quite a bit of feedback. So um, go ahead and type in a message if if it's getting a little too out of control and you can't quite understand what I'm saying. But uh, the response to this tool was overwhelming. Um, of course, we created it for our stakeholder group, which are um, mentoring programs to share with mentors and mentees. Um, but when this was created, the Department of Education um, saw this tool and said, what a wonderful resource. We've got to get this out. So they actually promoted this very broadly with their network of um, administrators, teachers, counselors, um, parent teacher associations, things like that, folks like that. Um, and just got the word out about this K-12 journey map to say, use it. It's, it, it has a lot of great STEM resources in it, but um, it's a great outline in terms of helping young people prepare for college. Um, in addition to that, we um, just very organically have had a lot of other folks find us from across the country to say, hey, we saw this great tool that you put online. Can we use it? Can we adapt it? Can we customize it? Um, we had an associate professor from the University of Florida who said, um, I, I definitely need to have this resource on my page. Um, we've had some local school districts um, and um, their counselors use it. We had one counselor um, from the Hopkins School District, and I just want to share his testimony because I thought it was um, very well said. He said, we've been using the K-12 journey map in grades 6 through 12 and have found it to be an excellent tool for advising students of all ages. The response I've received from parents, students, and school staff who've worked with the map have been overwhelmingly positive. Students find it to be fun and interactive, while parents and school personnel like the way it's clearly laid out with milestones, which can be checked off along the way. Many have commented that the road to college post-secondary training can be long and confusing, especially for those who have never navigated it, um, but that the map helps clearly lay out steps which anyone can follow. Um, we appreciate that, of course, uh, that kind of feedback from folks who are using it because it helps us understand how folks are using it, who they're sharing it with, and most importantly, um, that we're sharing it with young people who may not have that support system either at home or um, you know, maybe they're, they're first generation college uh, students and um, you know, maybe the parents um, or guardian at home um, don't, have, don't necessarily have that experience of navigating college, which again can be daunting. So this is a great tool um, to provide that context. And then we've had a foundation out in Washington State uh, contact us about this. They um, provide scholarships to young people at eighth grade and help them uh, prepare for college and then provide them that scholarship. And then what was really exciting is recently we had the Jenny Lynn School in North Minneapolis contact us and say, hey, we love this map. We are, our, um, oh, our principal, oh, can, can you still hear me? Okay. Mindy's going to try to work on something to um, to help with this this audio issue. Um, but the Jenny, Jenny Lynn School said, our principal wants one of these maps in every classroom. And so that was very exciting. We, we were able to make that happen for this upcoming school year. But the Unmuted. things we wanted to do with this, is, and, and we're in the process of doing now, is this is our 1.0 version, as we call it. We're looking at a 2.0 version. And as you can see with the map, it's heavily populated between 8th and 12th grade, but you don't see a lot of milestones between kindergarten and 8th. And so that's our second, um, that's the priority for our second version of this map, is to be able to look at the academic standards and state and federal guidelines between uh, K through, through 8 and make those milestones um, 
uh, prevalent in in the map and so that is that is our hope for the second version is to be able to really populate it um, as a comprehensive k through 12 journey map um, again you know it's it's usable and and very relevant at this point to help a young person prepare for college because again usually that happens around eighth grade but to have a full comprehensive map is is our goal um, and, and it helps to have you know mentors who are working with young students at the early age of five six to be able to see if they're they're hitting those academic standards and federal state and federal guidelines so that is our intent and one of our other um, um, goals with this K-12 journey map and the second version is to be able to create a marketing plan around this and to to work with public and school libraries to see if they would put an icon on the portals to have or to, to have this accessible to students um, and the Jenny Lynn school said they would they would be happy to do that as well as putting the posters up in their school so you can see it's already starting to build the momentum on this tool is already starting to build and we we anticipate it will grow much stronger especially um, with the second version of the map to make it more comprehensive but we've had just overwhelming support from um, from parents who have said thank you for this map it's great um, you know again we feel like we're we're well versed on, on what it takes to prepare our, our kids for college but um, this just helps us put you know it in context and it really helps us outline you know year to year what we really need to be doing to help our our, our kids um, we've had um, let's see counselors parents uh, there was a youth college bound program that was very interested in this as well as an immigrant youth and family education program um, they again thought that this would be a great uh, tool for them to use to help guide um, some of those classes that they were teaching on on helping their uh, the young people prepare for college. Um, just kind of the some of the enhancements we'd like to provide with the second version. We want to do a broad map view of of this K twelve journey map. Um, and so we want to make sure that we do two zoomed in expanded maps so have one map if you hover over k-12 when that's developed that that gives you a full scope map and then similarly k-8 to 12 um, that gives you the map that you currently see with some enhancements um, so that would be the intent on kind of the, the design enhancement on this um, to split it up into two eight and a half by eleven page views um, the other thing that that we want to make sure that that we keep true to and we built this into the first map is that as you can see it's not overpopulated with um, flash and animations and things like that and that was intentional we wanted to make sure that people who are using this map um, from all over our state all over the country have that it doesn't take too long for them to load this and and that they can click through to third-party resources and tools um, and so, you know, we, we remain committed to that in making sure that this is now, you know, they can, anybody can navigate this despite the level of internet speed connection. Um, so those, those are our, our hopes with the, and the goals of the, of the next version of our K-12 journey map. Um, just wondering if there are any questions out there. There are some Folks questions. Who, okay, great. Um, first is if the journey map um, information will be or is currently translated into any other languages uh, that's a great that's a great question and it has not at this point but that's something that um, we should definitely put on our list to look at as we de de develop the 2.0 version thank you for that mm -hmm. um, another is does the map link to any surveys about kids strengths so um, questionnaires about things that interests of students or any of those kinds of resources yep and uh, that college.gov I, I highly recommend that website um, that that was one of the links that Mindy was talking about when I went through that what I found really interesting about that particular website and that tool was that the kids could talk a little bit or enter in their strengths and things that they like to do um, and it would come up with what I found is it came up with uh, types of careers that um, that were pertinent to the, the information that they they entered in terms of their strengths, their interests, um, types of colleges, um, or the the colleges that um, that have strong 
um, emphasis on those uh, those careers and and those majors. Um, so that would be where I would start in terms of um, looking at um, what, where you can start to build on a on a young person's strengths. And you know, I think that that discovery piece too, they'll find they'll discover a lot of things that they may not have known about themselves with that college.gov site. Great. Oh, and FunWorks. There's a there's another one um, that's FunWorks, and that also looks at um, a youth's strengths and weaknesses, and uh, where they can build their build on their weaknesses, but also um, where they can build on their strengths. Perfect. Sure. Uh, this is April again, and I have, let's see, oh, Lindsay, I have to, there we go. Uh, there's a couple other questions here, too. There was one about how do we evaluate, um, probably back when we were looking at the research, about how do we evaluate the academic outcomes, uh, and with two minutes left in the webinar, I think you may have touched on a, a topic for a future webinar about how to evaluate those pieces, but I think if you look at, take a look at some of the research that will, that's in the, if you look at the the PowerPoint and download that later and, and click on some of those links and look at some of that research by digging in and, and reading some of their methodology, it might give you some really simple ideas of, of questions and things that you can ask in your evaluation of your program. And if you're not evaluating academic outcomes or if you're not evaluating you know, if you've learned something from some of the research, especially about the pathways to uh, to these academic outcomes, if you're not measuring some of the other predictors of academic success, you know, if you're only looking at GPA or only looking at other things and you only have that one-year uh, relationship or something to measure, then you might be missing out on some other things that you could eventually could tell your funders and, and, and other successes that your mentoring program might be happen, having. So, uh, and if you're a Minnesota program and, and want some more assistance with that, uh, that's what the mentoring partnership is here for. So you can contact me uh, directly and we can, we can look at what are you evaluating, what are you measuring, and, and think about if there's ways that you can strengthen that and improve that. Uh, another question was about, uh, is the journey map to encourage lifelong mentoring? Uh, you know, I've seen this with, about somebody who is mentoring and only expecting to work with them for about a year. So if you're using the journey map, does it sort of assume that you have to be with them through their entire K through 8 journey? And, um, you know, I think there are some programs that are looking for a lifetime commitment, but most of them are not. And so um, hopefully then if we're, if we're training and preparing mentors with the idea that they're, you know, to look for that autonomy and, and to build those pieces, this, you know, to have that structure and that this helps to build that autonomy that, and, and the relatedness and connectedness and, and competence that um, this is something that the young person can use on their own. Um, and it actually leads me to uh, to show you some of the other resources then, then too, uh, that I want to just make sure you know about in case you're not in Minnesota then too, or, um, or if you're looking for something to go even could go further. Uh, oh, before we do that, this is the last, uh, this is just a comment, for, again, from this Huffington Post piece, if you want to um, take a look at that. And uh, I just thought she just did a nice job of, of, of really summarizing this and thinking about, I just like the fact that it's from, you know, a young AmeriCorps member who's trying to make a difference in, in young people's lives. But uh, especially this second paragraph, you know, and that just the word crisis, as it's most often used, describes an unstable situation likely to have a highly unfavorable outcome. But looking at the Greek word um, uh, for decision crisis, it refers to a turning point, for better or for worse. So uh, just as she was, she's just asking for um, everyone to pitch in and, and make sure that in six years, all 34 of her uh, sixth graders will walk across the stage to receive a diploma. So. Um, you know, take a look at that that piece then too. And April, can I uh, just I'd like to address that question regarding does this um, promote you know long term sustainable mentoring? Um, it, what the beauty I, I would say the beauty with the K twelve journey map is that even if you're working in a school based mentoring program and you know the mentor is only with the student for a year, what's great about that is that it by having the student know that this is accessible to them and um, you know you can pick a, a mentor a new mentor can pick up where 
the last mentor left off and support the young person through the next, you know, their next um, school year and things like that. So I think that mm -hmm. that's the beauty of the, the journey map. Yeah, so looking at these resources, and if, you know, it is 1 o'clock, so if, uh, if you need to leave at 1 o'clock, that's okay, but we are wrapping up here, and can, can keep the webinar live if you have further questions, we'll just stay on, but if you need to go, thank you so much for being here. Uh, but for resources, this know how to go. Uh, when you when you download this, they actually have a section where it's all about encouraging young people to find a mentor, uh, and includes a, a section of resources specifically for those mentors. Uh, this is a, a, a colleague in Chapel Hill, and, and when they heard about this webinar, um, sent their college and career planning curriculum. They seem to think that that the journey map was much simpler and, and easier, and kind of like what Mayan was saying that you know not too complicated, but but if you're looking for something more detailed, or, or if you have a mentor who's looking for something more detailed, that's kind of where a lot of these things might go, where the journey map could be the start and can be that guide all the way through. And then um, when you get to certain points along the map or along that path, then you might need a little more information. Or maybe in 2.0, some of these things will be, will be links as well. Uh, yeah, so this is another one that I that I discovered. This realizing the college dream, and you you can get this this toolkit along with that, um, just for those programs that might be involved with Big Brothers Big Sisters to make sure you're aware of the Annex Ed Family Foundation Scholarship Program uh, for former for those who have been mentored by the Big Brothers Big Sisters organization. You know, thinking about is there is there a way to work something like that into your own mentoring program too? Is there a relationship you can have with a local funder or a local family foundation or, or someone who might be interested in making an investment in mentoring kids to graduation and on to college? Uh, some Minnesota-based resources that are Minnesota-based. Uh, the My Growth Plan is Minnesota-based, but uh, you know something to check out as another another approach to. Um, laying out a plan and, and, and having that interactive piece again with the journey map as the start and maybe you can can dig into that but something to um, just take a look at. Uh, but they have expanded to other states as well and for those of us here in Minneapolis um, the college and career initiative but they're also doing some different planning with young people. Again uh, you know, and there's other other resources too. I mean, we've got America's Promise and Ready by 21. I'm trying to list the resources that might be a good complement to the journey map. So by no means are these all the resources there that exist for, um, you know, getting young people to graduate or to go on to college. But thinking about the sort of plans and paths and 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 things that they, that um, young people can use, uh, along with and that mentors can access to help young people along that path. Again, uh, this presentation and others will be available at our slide, sh slide share uh, spot. That's the last link here at the bottom. Um, we'll send an email that will include that link. So then when you get the, the PowerPoint, you'll have lots of other links embedded within that. Um, and always our, our training institute and the, and the MPM training is available to help with some of those other pieces. Uh, and finally, just so we can wrap up, and then we'll answer some other questions for those of you who are still here, uh, it's just to know that the next Quality in Action webinar is July 7th. We'll be looking at Shining a Light on Supervision, which is uh, an article, and we'll have panelists um, Jenny Wright Collins and uh, Matt Korstad uh, from the Minneapolis Beacons Network, but this is actually from and the Forum for Youth Investment, and they did their out-of-school time policy commentary, so you can download that and read that in advance if you'd like, but for really looking at how do we supervise our staff and, and making some connections to if we're supervising those who are supervising mentors, but also what can we learn from that about how to supervise our mentoring relationships in order to um, get better outcomes. So, April, there was a question about um, about printing the journey map into posters. Um, we have a very limited number of posters. In fact, I think we have maybe about four or five left. But um, the intent is that we are, are looking at um, printing some more. So if you are interested in um, a printout version of the map, a poster size, uh, please let me know, and I will, um, I will be able to help you out in a first come, first with basis. Great. Yeah, and then also just so people know, yeah, you can print it. There, it's a there's a printable version online. You'll get a link to that map. Uh, you know, and I just wanted to mention um, that somebody else 
is it Lavon mentioned that uh, that she believes this map should be presented to youth in classrooms. So this could be something adapted in all schools so parents, teachers, and youth have an idea of where they should be. So yeah, it's kind of one of those things that we created and, and we'll see there's so many other uses for it and we'll, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll continue to find out about how all of you are using it uh, and, and others. So thank you so much for participating. If there are any other questions, just stay on and, and you can post those. Um, otherwise, look for a follow-up email with some more resources and hopefully you'll dig deeper and we can have lots of offline conversations as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayan and Mindy and Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks.